Okay, so the next talk is going to be about the Haskell infrastructure. Um, a little backstory is that uh, I discovered Nix last year because of uh, Rock's enthusiasm. And then I discovered the guy who was sitting across the table from me was actually one of the main Nix people, namely Peter Simons. So Peter has been uh, working on Nix for seven years now, and he's gained a lot of fame in the last months uh, because of his big efforts uh, into improving the Haskell infrastructure. And that's what he's going to talk about today. So uh, please welcome everybody, Peter Simons. Hi, thank you. Okay, um, the slides for this talk are online right now, so in case you want to read ahead and don't wait until we get to the point, you can do it. Um, I think that right now the, the Haskell users in, in Nix packages are in a fairly happy place because the packages sort of appear mysteriously, nobody really knows where they come from, nobody has to worry about updating them, they are just there and they are up to date. And I want to look in this talk at the process that gets Nix packages into that state. How do packages end up in Nix packages and how does the machinery work that makes this stuff build and make it, makes it work for the user. So I'm mostly interested actually in interesting aspects of the implementation. I'm not going to look at the user side in the sense of how do you install a Haskell package, how do you compose an environment with libraries. I don't, won't cover that at all. That's a, a different talk. Okay, the <clears throat> Haskell packages, when, you, when you're a user of Nix and you have an installation that involves Haskell packages, then these are the, the players, the entities that are involved in getting that stuff onto your machine. Obviously, a package, I have it as a se separate box there, but it's obviously part of the internet like <laughs> everything else. But what I mean is that you have package, which is the central repository of Haskell packages. So everything that's deemed worthy of being published to a worldwide audience is typically registered on, on Hackage. And then there is uh, a separate ecosystem of, of packages that exist on GitHub or SourceForge or whatever kind of servers people use where they also publish Haskell packages, but they don't necessarily register them on Hackage. And when you have Nix package, you get packages from both. So you have all of Hackage, all that's registered in the central repository is there, and you get other package in addition to that, which we pull in from other sources. For instance, the Cabal to Nix utility, which Haskell users typically uh, use, that's not registered on Hackage. That's a tool that's specifically for us, and so there seems to be no point of making it available or advertising its existence to, to everyone. So the, the data flow is like this, that packages show up on Hackage. Then there is a separate effort, which is called Stackage, which is called uh, Stable Hackage. And what these people do is that they take a subset of Hackage and make sure that they pick versions of all the relevant packages that are compatible with each other. Every Haskell developer knows that, that you can't just update one single package and everything still compiles. That's not going to work because these packages are very intricately interwoven with each other. And if you update one, then this typically requires that you update others because they depend on the newer version. And when you update those, something else will not compile because it hasn't been updated for the new versions yet. And it's a bit of a mess. And the stackage people, they resolve that for a subset of package and publish essentially a list of package names and versions. And whenever you pick a package in that version from that list, then you know it will work together with everything else on that list. And we take advantage of these efforts to provide a stable user experience. Okay, so we get packages directly from Hackage. We have obviously all of Hackage, not just the packages that are in Stackage. We have the rest too. But from Stackage, we take the additional version information. Then we take additional packages from other places in the internet. And we provide that in Nix packages to the user, who then has the ability to configure local overrides, add his own local packages, add packages from we don't even know about to his, his installation and use them within Nix, all nicely integrated. The process is uh, 
pretty obvious. <laughs> 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 So it works like this. Um, a publish shows up on Hackage. From there, it goes into this stackage arena, which has um, one repository that's called all cabal hashes, and that's a Git repository that contains all of Hackage, but it's versioned in Git. You have to know that Hackage does not provide that. Hackage does not provide any kind of versioning or anything like that. They have this one tarball that contains everything they have, and there you go. And if you have this all cabal hashes repository that continuously downloads this tarball, checks in the differences, and so you have a Git repository where you can actually see a bit of the history of when a package was um, added, when a package was edited, these kind of things are visible in that Git repository, but they are not visible on Hackage. So it's a service edited on top, but it's essentially just Hackage in a Git repository. Another nice feature that they add is that they download all those tarballs and compute the SHA hashes for those and add them into the repository. So when we generate build instructions, we don't have to download the packages to figure out those hashes, but they are in there already. I'll show you how it looks. So that's the basis that the stackage people use to do their work. And then every day they do a snapshot, a stackage nightly snapshot, they call it, where they basically update everything to the latest version that they can, then try to compile that, then they run into errors and see this doesn't compile, this doesn't compile, and then they manually configure, okay, don't use this update yet, or use this update, but specify some special flag, or disable the test suite, or somehow mess with the, the build to make it work. And then at the end of that process, when everything compiles, comes out this list of names and versions that is a nightly snapshot, which is the most recent stable package set that you can get. And then there is, on the same source, there is another basically family of package sets, which is the long-term support Haskell, LTS Haskell package sets. And these work like so. <clears throat> they Typically, whenever a new compiler version comes out, they start a new LTS package set, and then they call it LTS Packages 3.0. And then they pick the latest versions from their nightly build, whatever they have right now, and then continuously, every week, they release a new version of that package set, and they include only minor updates that don't break the API. So when a new package comes out that changes the, the interface of the library, it will never end up in that package set. So you as a user can say, I follow this package set, and I have production software that depends on the contents of those, 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 those libraries, then you will never get an update that requires you to modify your software in order to build, right? You have a stable API, but if someone fixes a bug or fixes a security vulnerability in a way that's not exposed in the API, then you will get that update. So you're not stuck on a fixed version, but you have stable updates, right? which is the, the idea. Okay, <clears throat> so these two build products, the, the Stackage Nightly and this family of package sets, they all live in Git repositories too, and these are huge JSON files that basically say for every package, this is the version you ought to choose, these are the flags you ought to specify, run the test suit, yes, no, build the head of documentation, yes, no, all the information is in there. And then we have a tool called Hackage to Nix, which consumes all of this. So it consumes the entire Hackage repository, it consumes the build information from the nightly snapshot and from the LTS Haskell snapshots, and then it's allocate some 30 gigabytes of memory because it's a Haskell program and you're not a serious Haskell program if you don't allocate 30 gigabytes of memory. <laughs> and then it writes a whole bunch of files into the, the file system, into the Nix package repository, which contains these and there are obviously the one on top, right? The hackage, packages.nix and these configuration files down at the top. So those are generated by hackage to nix. These are automatically generated. The hackage packages.nix contains build instructions for every package that we contain. So it's build instructions for every package, almost every hackage package. Then there is a common configuration 
which modifies the build instructions in there with fixes so that stuff works that the auto-generating tool doesn't know how to generate it correctly for some reason. Um, then there is another configuration layer which applies fixes that are required if you're building this package with a particular version of GHC. And then finally, there is the last uh, step which configures the versions that you see in those package sets so that they match the specification from the LTS Haskell package set. Now users, they basically cannot install any of this stuff directly. It's not possible. You can install the executables, that's possible, but if you have a Haskell library, you can't basically say, yeah, install this library and then you use it. It's not feasible. What you do is you build this GHC with packages environment in which you specify these are the libraries I want to have, and then Nix builds you a GHC binary that knows exactly those libraries that you want. And the place where you configure that is this uh, overrides uh, attribute set, which is in your config.nix file in your home directory. So there you choose packages either from the GHC specific package set or from the LTS specific package set. And then you can optionally pull in additional packages where you generate instructions with Cabal to Nix automatically. And then this whole process ends up in a place where you can install it. And then you have pretty much the entire Haskell ecosystem at your fingertips. So Hackage, um, I'm gonna, in the rest of the presentation, I'm basically going through those boxes, each one by one, right? So Hackage, um, it contains over 60,000 Cabal files, which group into about 9,000 packages. So this means that on average, every package releases approximately nine versions, uh, seven versions. There is this, uh, this box plot shows you that half of all packages lie within this range. So if you take any random package from Hackage, chances is, are that it will have between two and eight versions released. So there are some packages that rare that release that have 150 releases by now. So they release, I don't know, once a week or something like that. And there are packages that release a new version every couple of months and many never ever release a version. <laughs> a new version. They have to have at least one, otherwise they wouldn't be there, right? So the Git repository that contains Hackage is just a long, long list of directories. The directory always matches the name of the package. In every directory, you have another directory which matches the version number of the release, and inside of that directory, you have the Cabal file, which contains the build instructions, and you have a JSON file, which is added from by Stackage, which contains the hashes. And these Cabal files, they look like this. You have this um, general section, which defines, you see it, right? Your home page, the version number, the package name, general information about the package. And then the components of the, the package are defined below that. You can define a library, you can define executables, you can define benchmarks, test suits, and they all have the same syntax and the same structure. So. Typically, if you have a library, you define what publicly visible modules you expose, you define what other packages you depend on, and this here is uh, the part that makes installing Haskell packages so much fun. Uh, you can very accurately restrict the versions of your dependencies. So you can say, in this case, I want the base library only if it's uh, older than version 6. So, this is a convention in, in the Haskell ecosystem. You can't upload a package to Hackage unless you configure that. And, okay, but from my point of view, why do you do that? What, why, why, do, why do you say, yeah, if it's base version fine, a 5, then let, okay, compile, but if it's version 6, which doesn't exist, it's not there, there is no version 6, then don't compile you have no idea whether version 6 is actually going to cause any problems or not. But that's reason enough for them to say, since we don't know that it will work, we'll prevent you from using it just to be sure. <laughs> and since everybody does that, and most people actually don't understand the implications of that, right? people have no idea what versions to choose. If you have... 10 dependencies, and each of those dependencies has four different versions, then you have 
a huge permutation of trees of things that you would have to test in order to have an accurate specification that reflects reality. But obviously you can't do that. So what people will do is, yeah, I restrict it to the version I've been using and it's fine. And so when people update the base library or transformers library or whatever, then all those builds are going to say, I won't compile because you have the wrong version. And they would compile just fine if the restriction hadn't been there in the first place. But they decided to err on the side of uh, caution. <laughs> there is uh, another important thing. It's this line here. It says that this is a simple build. A simple build means that this build configuration is actually entirely declarative. So this is a text file. There's no code. There's no code ever being executed. And just by parsing that file, we know everything about the build that there is to know which is extremely convenient if you want to translate these things into Nix instructions. There is another build type, which is called custom. And when you have that build type, then basically all bets are off. What that means is that you ship um, an executable program, the source code for an executable program called setup.hs, and the Haskell build system will compile that and run that to configure the build and do the build. So at that point, you can declare in the file basically whatever you want, and then you can have the program do whatever it wants, and those two things don't have to be related. So basically, when you have a custom build type, there is no way to extract the information about the build from the file that you need. That's bad for Nix. The good news is that the interface to this kind of custom build system is so complicated and so poorly documented that nobody ever uses it. <laughs> and if they use it, they use it for like super, super simple things like I want to add an additional compiler flag on the command line somewhere and that doesn't affect us, so it's fine, right? But if they would do something that would affect us, like we add additional dependencies or we make the existence of a dependency dependent on some property of the system or not, then we would have no way of figuring that out. So this is the other file, which is fairly obvious, right? It's just, uh, <clears throat> there are these tar tarballs which contain the, the software, and then we have a whole bunch of hashes for those, and we need them to generate the Nix expression, which looks like this. So this is essentially meta information. We could do without that. So we can describe that build essentially in those three lines. That's all you need. Obviously, we need um, the package name, the version, and we need the hash of the, the tarball, and then we have to specify the dependencies. We distinguish between dependencies of the library components, of the executable components, and of the test components. The reason why we do that is that when you run the build and you disable tests, then we don't need the dependencies that are required purely for the test suit. So we specify them separately, and if you run the build without tests, then the test dependencies will not be included, and they won't be required. Which is why a lot of Haskell builds can be fixed by disabling the test suit, because oftentimes people update their software to cope with the new versions, but they don't run their own test suit, and they don't update their own test suit. And then we run their test suit and say, yeah, man, <laughs> you haven't updated the test suit. And then we just disable it and it still works, right? But it's, uh, they should probably have a good CI system. Um, there are a couple of things in Hackage that make the packaging process very interesting. Uh, one of the extremely nice features is destructive editing. So what you can do is you upload a tarball to Hackage, and that contains the cabal file plus all, all the source code. That's the entire package. And then you can go to the website and edit the cabal file and change it. And what happens is that it's not going to get a new release, but it's edited in place. So the version changes. So they did that. Then they realized gee, this changes the hash of our release tarball. This is bad, and lots of people would complain about that. So what they do is, when you download the release tarball, you get the old version, and then you look into the cabal file and see that there is this X minus revision header, and if it's there, then this tells you that there is a new cabal file, which you download extra and replace the existing one with that. Um, the good, obviously... <coughs> 
There is nothing in place that prevents people from including that line in their Cabal file when they upload in the first place, which is breaks, oh, I think they fixed it by now, but it broke a lot of software, obviously. The second thing is that this revision number, it doesn't show up anywhere. So when you install a package, and then you go to the website and see, okay, the build has been edited in some way, right? Then there is no way to tell whether the version that you installed is the new one or the old one. Uh, for Nix, obviously, this is a bit of a nightmare. So what we do is that we track this revision number, we needed the revision number only to construct the URL for the Cabal file. We don't use that information otherwise. And we have the hash of the new Cabal file. And when you have a destructive edit um, taking place, then the build log will say something at the beginning. Okay, I have a new Cabal file. And then this is downloaded and replaced. And then, yeah, then you have in-place editing. Because just making a new release would have been more difficult, I suppose. There is... Another nice feature, and this is a particularly extreme example, you can have uh, all, all the items in a Cabal file can depend on things and make choices conditionally on the value of those things. You can configure your build differently depending on whether you compile with a new or an old version of GHC. You can change your behavior on the operating system, right? For instance, here you say, okay, if I'm a Windows build, then I won't need that. But if I'm not a Windows build, then I need that library. And obviously, this makes the interpretation of these files a little less straightforward because when we generate the build extractions, the right choice would be to say, okay, we pass all those conditional trees and then we do some cool optimizing and filter out things that don't affect us and then we generate build extractions, expressions that um, cover those conditionals, right? We say, if I am on system Linux, then add these dependencies, and if I'm on system Darwin, then add these dependencies, and we would basically capture, capture that in Nix. It's just that doing that is actually difficult, and so we don't. What we do is, we assume all builds run on Linux using the latest GHC, then we resolve all those conditionals, and these are the build instructions that we generate. So this means that we have builds that work fine on Linux, but if you run the exact same build on Darwin, it's not going to succeed. Fortunately, these cases are rare, and so rather than fixing our generator, which is hard, we added this level of configuration, which I showed you, right? This config common where you can add build dependencies and mess with the, the build expressions in a manually edited way. And we do that for most of the packages that, that need it, and it's not that many, fortunately. But anyway, this is an area where the <clears throat> Cabal to Nix tool essentially has to be improved, that it expresses this kind of intelligence in the build. Last but not least, there is a feature which is perhaps the nastiest of all of them. Um, builds can say... They can define flags. These flags are Boolean values. A flag is anything. It's just a, a string. And then you can have conditionals based on whether this flag is set or not. Now, what this build does, uh, first of all, it's important to know that whether this flag is set or not is never visible after the build has run. So you've run a build, and then you wonder, does it have HTTPS support? And there is no way to tell except for trying an HTTPS URL and see whether it works. But the values of those flags are not visible in the version information. There's also no way for Haskell packages to depend on a library saying, I want this version of the library, but I need this flag enabled. It's not possible. They can't do it. So it's a tricky feature. The nice thing about those flags is that the value of those flags is support, users can specify it. As a user, you can say, I want HTTPS support, and then you enable it. But if you don't do it, then Cabal will guess the value of the flag depending on your build environment. So if you have these libraries installed in your environment, then Cabal will say, aha, I can use this branch, and it will enable HTTPS. And if you have this library, but it's, say, version 2.1, then it says, yeah, that's too new, and then you don't have HTTPS support. 
and also this is something that we can't express in Nix, right? Because sometimes people use these flags for something that's actually useful. They say, I don't know, build with LLVM and then they enable additional optimizations or something like that. So we would like to offer our users the ability to say, I want this package and I want it with LLVM. So our build instructions would technically have to contain some Boolean parameter that's called HTTPS support. And then as a user, you can pass true or false and get the build with the appropriate flag set or disabled. And this is also something we currently can't do. What we do instead is that we have one global list of flags where we for every package specify the flags that are specified. And for most parts, we just let Cabal guess and see what happens. It works good enough. <laughs> okay, the next box in this diagram was Stackage. Stackage has about 18% of hackage covered. When you want your package in Stackage, you actually have to register with them. You have to say, this is my email address, this is my Twitter name, this is my GitHub account, these are the packages I'm responsible for. You have to promise that you will fix build errors within a reasonable amount of time. You have to have a backup administrator in case you're on vacation. And then once you've registered in the database, your packages will be part of Stackage. And then you're part of a sort of automatic machinery that updates things and informs the authors if there are problems and then they respond quickly and then you have this stable package set, right? This curated package set. Stackage um, runs all these builds in uh, GitHub uh, Travis CI, which means it's only Linux builds. So when you get information from Stackage that says, this package in this version is going to build fine, then it's not necessarily going to build fine on, on, on a Mac because they don't test that. In Nix, we do have a Mac, right? We do have support for that platform. So Mac users or basically anything other than Linux users don't get the full value out of this whole LTS effort because their platforms aren't tested. Uh, then there is, I talked about that already, the build products are these nightly snapshots, which is the latest possible version so that everything compiles. There are LTS minor releases, which are released every week and contain updates that don't break the eye. And the major releases, they may break APIs, but they are rare. We are now at LTS major version 3. So 4 is going to come out together with GCC 7.12.3. I don't know. We are not at 12, we are 10, right? <laughs> I don't <laughs> Okay. So the code or the, the, the program that does all the automatic stuff these are these two, two tools, Cabal to Nix and Hackage to Nix. They live on GitHub. And actually, all the intelligence about how do you generate a build expression, what kind of exceptions have to be configured in, and so on, is included in one library. And then both of these executables are just front ends to that library. The Cabal to Nix tool is supposed to be used by users. This is a tool where you say, I have a Cabal file, give me a Nix expression that builds it. That's what this does. The hackage to Nix executable, on the other hand, says, give me hackage, stackage, and then I generate your Nix package. So it updates the whole package set. And people are typically not supposed to use that. Instead, we have this run, uh, this update Nix packages script that's run automatically. And so basically once an hour, we take all the new versions, all the new information, generate a new version of Nix package, commit it into a separate branch, first of all, so that there is some testing. We have a Hydra instance that continuously builds all that stuff, and only after we have seen, okay, this stuff is really stable and it really works, then we merge it into master. So basically, updates on master, uh, they could, in theory, appear once an hour. So in theory, if someone uploads a package to Hackage, we would have it 60 minutes later at most. De facto, we merge to master. I do it manually. <laughs> so whenever I think of it, I merge it, and it's every two or three days or something like that. So basically, if you're following the master branch of Nix package, you have an accurate rep representation of Hackage that's within two or three days, which is, I think, pretty good. Okay. So now the Nix package machinery is uh, 
interesting in itself. I just have to check the time because we are running out of time. Uh, the package set, there is, what we have is we have this one attribute set which contains the builds for all the packages that we, that we, that we feature. And what you see is this is what it looks like. We define for every package um, an attribute that matches exactly the name of that package. And then there is this whole call package thing that you probably know that how packages are defined in Nix. The only difference is that here we don't refer to a separate file, but instead we have all the expressions in place. So there is one file and it's completely self-contained. And then we have for every package the latest version, which is the one that has this only package name attribute. And then we have typically older versions, which are required for LTS support. And these have their version number added to them at the back. So when dependencies are resolved, only the packages without this kind of suffix are used. So when you say, I depend on MTL, you will get the latest version. And when you say, I want to depend on MTL 2.1.3.1, then you have to say that explicitly. You get the latest version by default. So this package set is implemented as a recursive function. And this is a, it's a lot of fun <laughs> when you know about how it works, but I suppose it's uh, new for, for many people. In, uh, the, the idea is that this package set is a function. That function produces a package set, and as an argument, it gets the package set that it's going to produce. The, <laughs> the idea is uh, here is an, a nice example where you can see how that works. You have this package set which gets itself as an argument. Then it defines those two attributes and then it defines this attribute which refers to these attributes via itself, right? And so when you have when you compute a fixed point, this is the point where the argument and the output are the same. <laughs> then you compute this function. When you expand that self-argument again and again and again, you end up just repeatedly calling PS, 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 PS. And at some point, this package set contains no more reference to self. And when it doesn't reference self, self is not computed because it's la lazy evaluated. And then the computation finishes. Yeah. The yeah yeah I was you have this construct in Nix you have this recursive attribute set, but the recursive attribute set doesn't work this nicely because um, I have to go, it will be clear after this example. One thing why we do this, why we structure the package set in this way, is that this makes it really convenient to modify the package set in a way that um, looks like object of oriented inheritance. So what you have is you have this function, which as arguments takes a recursive package set, and it takes another function. And this function takes a recursive package set, and then it computes changes it's going to make to that package set and returns the result as another recursive package set. So when you when you take this example and you compute the fixed point without any customization, you will get foobar as a result. But when you apply this function to modify it, this function here, then you have the function, right? It has its own output, it has its input, and this is a change it specifies to be applied to the thing. So in here, we replace foo with the value of foo reversed. And when we apply this, we get this output. So we have modified the package set. If this had been a recursive attribute set in the Nix sense, then the self argument wouldn't have been necessary, right? But in this case, this would have been bound, this would have bound tighter than any modification you could make. If you would modify the foo value of that package set, you would not modify foo bar because this has already been bound. Yeah. So you can basically, whenever you want to modify the package set, you can choose between give me the value from above and I modify it and return it as a result. Or you can say, give me the result of another modification. So you can refer to your 
to basically a series of, of, of overrides that happen. And you can here, in the inner one, refer to a result that's going to compute it here. So this is an extremely flexible construct. And the package set, yeah, we have, I'm going to come to an end. And the package set, this is it. <laughs> that's the actual code. Um, we have the Haskell packages. This is the file that I showed you, which contains all the build expressions. To that, we apply this common configuration, which fixes missing dependencies that we couldn't extract, or which adds other libraries that we want to enable flags during compilation. Then we extend that with the compiler-specific configuration. Then we extend that with the package set specific configuration that gives you the version information. And then at the end, we extend that with user configured overrides that you can specify to change it. And then we say fix. And then we get a result where this original package set that we once generated automatically may look completely different. It has different versions, different build inputs. You can do with it whatever you please. Okay. And. This stuff, I'll, the other three slides, I'll save for another talk. <laughs> okay. Thanks for the talk, Peter. Uh, we have a couple of minutes to understand what the fixed point is. So, <laughs> should, should. Don't be shy. I'm here. Uh, where are you? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> what well, I think I already asked you probably um, a few months ago, but how could we reuse this functionality, which extends and overrides, and um, into other languages as well? Because it's it, it. I see it as a common piece that if you generate something from whatever stackage or PyPy or. Uh, Bundlers, things, oh, right? Ah, oh, everything, right? Uh, Everybody so, needs that, yeah. And then you build this uh, set, and you need to override, well, few in few different layers. Could we then kind of abstract this and kind of create this more unified way how to approach languages and import them? Would that be an option? Mm -hmm. to um, technically, it's absolutely feasible um, when you... The, basically, the entire infrastructure that you need for this are those two functions. This is, this is the real thing. This, they don't, it are not more complicated than this. Um, this code is in, in the package set. It's there. It's, it can be reused, right? So everybody is free to use that approach and structure the packages in such a way that you have this base package set, which is kind of the bare default. And then you can have layers of configuration added on top of it. And it's not difficult to do. The thing is, it's, it's effort, right? You have to do it. Um, for instance, I also generated the package set for um, R, for the R utility, and it's some, I don't know, 7,000 packages in there. And it's not structured in this way, because um, at the time when I did that, I had no idea about this stuff. So these days, every time I have to work with the R package set, I think, man, this is a mess, and it should really be cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, I, I once grabbed Nix packages for fix and const and such functions, and there are maybe three or four places where those functions are defined yeah. because they're so useful. So maybe include them in the live lib. lib. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so actually, I think. We should probably use this for Nix packages at the top level because yeah. right now Nix packages has a yeah a pretty ad hoc uh, override mechanism, which is really an undisciplined way of doing this. So there is sort of uh, so Nix packages de actually defined by passing itself into itself, uh, and then some complications for being able to refer to the unoverridden uh, version. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this this would be much better. So. We should probably look into uh, how we can do that. Yeah, somebody should do that. Yeah. Someone should. Do that. <laughs> we should. We should open a GitHub issue. <laughs> uh, 
pardon? It's right. Uh, Niklas has actually taken the, the effort upon himself. Yeah. Andy? I think there may have been some start already by factoring out the package overrides mechanism, which is, uh, well, it's the same mechanism again or very similar. And uh, there have been some changes recently by Jen, uh, that uh, this, yeah, well, well, it's factored out into a function, I think, that, that you can say, I want these packages and apply package overrides uh, and get it as a package set. Not, not just in the general way that you edit it somewhere in dot next package config. Hey, I'm sorry, I have a very practical question. The older versions of, of libraries, we keep them just for LTS, so we can't rely on them being in next packages like tomorrow, or like rather after the next release of LTS. Um, theoretically, we could say we drop support for LTS Haskell zero point something, and if we did, then packages required only by that version would go away, that's true. Um, the reality is, however, that the number of versions we ship is only going up. So, uh, personally, I think that this whole intelligence that selects which package to include and which ones not, that should go away entirely. We should just say, we have every version on Hackage, period. Right? That's what we should do. It's uh, only a matter of um, what's the implication on the next tools in terms of memory requirements, parser, performance, these kind of things we have to figure out, right? But I think that the versions we distribute, the number of versions that we distribute is going to go up only. It's not going down. I think so. Hi. Um, actually, I have two questions. Um, like, the first question would be, uh, what does the stack tool, um, like, do you have any th thoughts on this? Or? Mm -hmm. Um, the stack utility is a kind of um, advanced version of Kabal install. It's a build driver, so you can write a very simple JSON file, YAML file, where you specify, I have this package, I have these dependencies, and then you just say stack build, and it's doing everything automatically. It downloads the packages, compiles the dependencies, sets up a sandbox for you. It's all very convenient, and it's very nice, and I use it myself. It's a great tool. Um, it interacts perfectly with, with Nix, there is no, no problem. If you, have, um, if you use Nix to install a compiler in a library environment, and Stack sees that it needs some of those libraries that you already have installed, then it will reuse them and it won't compile them. So in theory, you could say in your Stack file, I use LTS version 3.3, and then you configure a GHC environment in the LTS 3.3 package set, which contains exactly those packages that you need, and then you would run stack build, and it wouldn't compile anything, because it's already there. So in a way, um, the two tools complement each other, right? It's, uh, I guess the advantage of stack is that it's very ad hoc-ish. You don't have to uh, write a Nix expression, save it somewhere, enter a Nix shell, leave a Nix shell. You don't have, have to bother. You can just run stack and it works. But um, I think it's uh, if people want to develop with stack and use Nix at the same time, it's just working just fine. No problem at all. Um, thank you. And uh, my second question would be, when you clone Nix packages, what's the percentage of Haskell packages in the... <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I actually wrote an email about that a while ago, but I don't recall the numbers. It's, it's significant. Uh, I think we have Haskell packages are something like 12,000, I think. At Nix packages as a whole has maybe 15,000 or something like that, not including the Haskell packages. So it's uh, a large, large chunk, right? Uh, 
but in terms of how much space it takes up in a, in a repository, I think the, it's probably even even bigger, the percentage of Haskell packages, because we have home pages, synopsis, all this stuff that we take from the Gabal file, which many packages don't have. So it's hard to say, but uh, it's a fairly good part of the distribution. Yeah. All right, thanks, Peter. Thank you. My pleasure.